redeemed through one man, even over the people's lives that were not under the law period of history. So let me repeat Romans 5.14. Nevertheless, death ruled over all the people who lived between Adam and Moses. Well, all the people that lived between Adam and Moses were people that weren't yet under a law system as far as the Ten Commandments that were instituted in Exodus 20. Well, the people that lived before Exodus 20, the people between Adam and Moses, well, they ended up getting the death penalty. Well, why should they get the death penalty? Because it says in Romans 5.13 that their sin shouldn't be taken account of. Because they weren't under a law system, why should their sin be accounted for or penalized with death if they weren't under a law system? And yet it's saying in Romans 5.14 that the death penalty reigned over these people that lived from Adam to Moses. It goes on to say, even reigned over the people that did not sin in the likeness of Adam's violation. In other words, they as individuals didn't sin as a direct Disobedience to a direct command, don't eat forbidden fruit. They had never seen the forbidden fruit. They had never been personally in the Garden of Eden. And yet the death penalty for eating forbidden fruit was ruling over them, even though they as individuals were under a grace time rather than a law time, and yet they were getting a death penalty. Now is this just God being unjust? Is this God being unfair? No, because Though they were not guilty as individuals, though they didn't sin in the likeness of Adam's sin as individuals, they did sin on the other side of the coin. What do I mean by the other side of the coin? I mean the fact that we have an individual identity, but if you flip the coin over, we also have a group identity. Yeah, Bob Bue is an individual as somebody, but Bob, as a member of Adam's race, is a completely different person. <laughs> Kayla has an individual Kayla. identity. She's an individual. But as far as her group identity is concerned, she ends up being the same as me. The same view that I am, she is. <laughs> Kayla's different than me. She's a girl, I'm not. But in terms of view, it's absolutely the same. It's no difference. And that's what I'm saying that in Romans 5.14, it says, nevertheless, the death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over people that as individuals didn't deserve the death penalty. But the reason that they got the death penalty is because they sinned before they were born as individuals. They sinned in relationship to their representative, Adam, who represented them as the group identity that included them even before they were born. So to put it in a very simple way, they sinned in Adam, outside of who they were as individuals. And that's why they're getting the death penalty according to Romans 5.14. And then what does it say in Romans 5.14 at the end of the verse? It says, Adam, is a type. The Greek word typos, what we get the English word type from, can be translated pattern, and the NIV translates it pattern. So I'll just go with that. That in Romans 5.14, Adam is a pattern of the one to come. Adam is a pattern of the one to come. Well, who is the one to come in this case? It's Jesus. So what is it that Adam and Jesus have in common? They certainly don't have the experience of sin in common. You remember in Hebrews 4, where Jesus is tempted in all points as we're tempted, yet was without sin. Remember that? Hebrews 4, about verse 15. He was tempted in every way as we're tempted, but was without sin. So Adam had something in common with Jesus in Romans 5.14. Adam is a type of Christ. Adam is a pattern of him. But not in terms of his experience, 
because his experience was that of a sinner and Jesus' experience was that of not being a sinner. In fact, the only one not being a sinner. So when Adam is a type or a pattern of Jesus, then what they have in common, Adam and Christ, what they have in common is not experience. Because one's experience is that of being a sinner and the other's is that of being a saint. They don't have that experience in common. But what they do have in common is something outside of their experience. And what do they have in common outside of their experience? Identity. The principle of group identification. Both men represent all other people. Both men represent mankind. Both people represent humanity. In fact, in one scripture, in one scripture in 1 Corinthians 15.45, Jesus is actually said to be entitled the last Adam. Jesus takes on the title the last Adam. 1 Corinthians 15.45. Well, how can he do this? Well, we heard in Romans 5.14 that Adam is a type of Christ, that he's a pattern. And the way that he's a pattern is that both Adam and Jesus are group identities. They both represent everybody else. They both represent humanity. So Jesus being called the last Adam in 1 Corinthians 15.45 is like calling him the last humanity. He's the last person to act in such a way that everybody else is going to act the same way that he did, not in their individual experience, but by identification with what he did. They'll get tagged with what he did. In the case of Adam, it'll be negative. In the case of Jesus, it's good. And that's what Romans 5.15 is fixing to say. And in fact, in Romans 5.15, we're going to end up getting a specific contrast between what Jesus did for everybody that Adam disadvantaged. Romans 5.15 is going to end up saying what Jesus did for everybody that Adam disadvantaged.